The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and today we're having a vintage versus modern console showdown. On one side we've got very early 1980s handhold console. That's what I'm calling it, you can disagree if you like. But we've also got the Sony PSP. I absolutely loved the design and actually to a lot of degrees kind of still do. I, I, I find it really pleasing console. Anyway, we're not here to wax lyrical about how I think they look. Let's get inside. I think I'm gonna start with uh, oil panic. Some of you will either already know the history behind these or will have already spotted the significance of this little console. Nintendo started in the games industry in 1974 when they partnered up with Magnavox on their Odyssey console. Uh, it wasn't until 1979 they started working on their own arcades. They started with the silver in 1980, moved on to the gold series, then they moved on to a widescreen series, I believe. Then in 1982, they started releasing dual screen models. Now, I believe this one actually comes from May 1982 and is called Oil Panic. I promise I will be gentle and I promise this will go back together because it does work and it was gifted to me. The Game & Watch series got quite an interesting history to it because although Nintendo had released Donkey Kong on arcade, I think Game & Watch were the first time that Mario Brothers had their own standalone game. Now aside from the obvious difference in LCD, the form factor of this really reminds me of uh, the Nintendo DS. There's something about it which kind of feels like it was a direct descendant. <laughs> ah, okay. 4.3 mil screw only. Really nicely built so far. We've got a piezo on the back, uh, which unfortunately that rolled bead around there is uh, either thermally or ultrasonically melted around it. So I can't get that little speaker out, but I don't want to be desoldering it either. So unfortunately I'm just going to have to solder along with it being really careful. Now, I'm also being really aware not to put too much pressure on the uh, on the back of the screens because if I damage those it's absolutely game over so I'm going to be very very careful just to put torque on the screws not any downward pressure. Oh uh, I've just while we're here we've got a production date of 22nd week of 1982 so week 22 would have been late May early June as a production run I think something along those lines. It's nice to know we had a, an early original run. Now in total, there were 60 Game & Watch games consoles available, but you couldn't actually buy all of them. Two of them were only available as prizes um, or as special promotional giveaways direct from Nintendo. So as a general member of the public, you could only get 58 of them. And that spanned right from 1980 to 1991 when the last original release Game & Watch game was released. There have been modern re reproductions. I think there was a run in 2010 of one of the early consoles, ball, Balls? Balls, can't even say. Um, but there have also been re-releases of the games on other consoles. I think there was a pack of games you could get on the Nintendo GameCube, and I think there was also a set you could get on the Wii. Wow. So this multi-conductor zebra strip at the bottom just presses directly onto the back of the LCD screen. So actually that connection, that rigidity, the straightness of that is super critical to the, this game working. It's a nice little, looks like silicon gasket that sat on the back of there just to make sure that contact was consistent. And obviously this little uh, screw hole in the center is to make sure that metal plate has got constant pressure across the ribbons. Otherwise I would suggest in the middle where it bows slightly, you'd get uh, less contact. Now this will be the mirrored section, which slightly diffuses and reflects the backlight. Cause of course these didn't have backlights. They were um, reflective LCDs. So just like the original digital watches and seven segment displays. So that reflects the light that going in, but depending on the charge and position of the LCD screen, depends on how much light is reflected out through the screen. Now there's the rear decal. It's nice that they've actually done layers of the permanent etching. So you've got a layer behind and a layer in front. It gives a pseudo sort of sense of parallax or three dimension to it. Obviously it's uh, 
not the most convincing effect, but it's kind of cool all the same. And this basically invisible sheet has got all of the etching and the liquid crystal. And if I hold it at just the right angle, see the contacts, ah, ah, yeah, interesting. If I hold this at just the right angle to the light, I can see it, I'll do my best to capture it. And I can see the, the traces in the glass where a lot of the, uh, the, the segments are laid out. But interestingly, not all of the conductors on that zebra ribbon are used. There's gaps there, there, there. But yeah, this is one of the parts and that is actually glass. That's not plastic, that's not anything else. So if I crack that, break that, scratch that, it's game over. Oh, different method of assembly here. I've already let that backdrop in the mirror slide. So you've got all your function buttons up the top, all membrane buttons, all uh, just conductive coating on the rubber. Same for every single button, because there's a conductive rubberized strip at the back here, which will be doing the same job as this for the top half, pressing all the contacts at the bottom of the screen. Uh, that's probably just stuck on. Okay. I hope nobody accuses me of being a wimp and not doing a full job of a teardown, but I really don't want to force this LCD screen out uh, off of its contacts. First of all, I'm not sure I would ever get the alignment back up right to be able to um, get the bottom screen working again. Second of all, it is so stuck, I'm really worried that I would damage it trying to get it off. So I, I hope people are with me on that decision and uh, don't mind my decision. There's a few passives on the board. I think that's a crystal. Uh, a couple of fire resistors and a capacitor, but actually almost all of it's integrated onto this single chip, which is an OP51281D branded Nintendo. Now the other thing to note is that this is not a surface mount component. Well, it is, but it's not. It's actually sat suspended midway through the board. Now, I'm not sure that that's a necessity of the component. I'm not sure you have to mount the component in that way. What I think they've actually done is mounted it that way so you can win back the thickness of the board because this is a single layer, single sided PCB. There is only etching on here. Neat idea. Well, there we have the absolute finest the 1980s had to offer us, or at least in 1982 anyway. And we've got a single PCB with a single integrated circuit, single layer, single side, a very clever manipulation of LCDs. And now, I just want to talk about that for a moment because the, the use of LCDs absolutely fascinates me in terms of game design because it's very easy to sort of lose yourself in the idea of sort of a sprite or an object, especially with modern program languages and ways of thinking and thinking if this object takes on a particular property and does this action, this movement across a screen, which is all generated in an API, you don't do any real hardware programming. But when you're designing the game on this, you've got to work very closely with the LCD designer and say, right, this is going to be segment A, this is going to be segment B, this is going to be segment C. And you've got to manipulate that and turn that very basic binary input, output, on, off state into a storyline and into a game. And to be able to conceptualize this, I find really impressive. I think it's much easier these days to come up with a complex game because so much of the design process is visual. What you see is what you get. When you were writing the software for this, you had to think, this input goes on, it appears like this. That is going to need this input down here in sympathy in this state to look like you're throwing your oil over the balcony. I, th I think the breed of game designer back then was just a totally different thing. And I have nothing but admiration for anybody that was capable of doing it. So that's the 1980s. Let's have a look at the early noughties. Okay, fast forward 20 years in technology evolution and gamer understanding, and you end up with the PlayStation Portable, first released in 2004, so 22 years after, uh, in Japan, whereas the international release followed nearly a year later in the rest of the world. Now, as I've already said, I. I love this form factor. I, at the time, I loved the design. There's something really classy about it and I don't know what exactly it is. I think it is to do with this smooth, complete overmolding of the bezel. It's a really subtle detail, but the fact that the color is applied to clear plastic on the back, which means you get that clear polished glass edge on it. I don't know, I just, I love it. And even today when I bought this to tear it down, I kind of really struggled. I really just wanted to keep it and play with it. Now, the quality of games you get on this are 
Not as polished as the device looks itself, I'm sorry to say. They probably look like a high quality PS1, maybe an early PS2 game. But it's still a great console and there's a lot to like about it. That said, there is one thing about this which I think Sony made a really big mistake on. And that is around here. Sony, bless them, trying to um, corner the market for their own storage medium, insisted on putting the Sony memory stick in it. I wish so much they'd gone with the much easier, much more prolific, and even at the time, much cheaper SD card standard. Now, obviously, most people watching this are gonna be very familiar with the micro SD standards and cards, and probably have 30 of them around the house. Let's face it, if you're watching this channel and you don't have a half dozen Raspberry Pis at home, you're probably new. <laughs> But that, to me, is the first big design flaw. The other decision which is interesting is the UMD. Now, the Universal Media Disc um, is a format completely bespoke and not used anywhere other than the PSP, which of course meant you ended up with smaller volumes, they cost more, and they were a bit kind of useless. Now, I appreciate that this is due to the density of it and how much information they needed to store on it, but it feels like a shame they couldn't have found another way. I mean, even shipping the games on the memory sticks, I think would have been more resilient. From what I know of people that owned PSPs at the time, it was always failure of this very intricate and beautiful mechanical system. I think they lost the ability to stay closed quite early on. Physical nature of the disc meant they were suffered, subject to vibration distortion, which is not great for a handheld console that you want to play on the go. One thing I will say in their favor, and I wish modern console designers would listen, and phone designers for that matter, use a replaceable batteries. Why did they ever disappear? Now, we also had a nice little headphone socket with a remote control port for if you were listening to music on it. I should have known. I guarantee behind a sticker, yeah, we'll find another screw. I wonder if that sticker there says warranty void if removed. Unfortunately, my Japanese is not that strong. <laughs> there we go, much better. Wow. That is some engineering already. We've already got membrane buttons over here with, I think they're light pipes for the LEDs, so we're likely to find the LEDs actually on the board, yeah. And the analog sticks actually fitted into the front of the, with a series of um, little pins. That's a much nicer way of assembling and disassembling than having ribbon cables running to the front. So yeah, that's actually a neat little touch. So those, those four pins press onto the analog stick, making the analog stick a completely standalone module. Very sensible way of actually manufacturing. It'd be much easier to install and maintain. See, this is another example of a really nice design. Clear lump of plastic with just this white transfer on the back edge. So when you look at it from the top, it looks like it's the L is right on the ridge, but it's never gonna wear because it's behind this white plastic. That's just a nice detail. Let's lift this LCD out. Very beautiful little screen, actually. Looks really nice when it's on, but actually the resolution's terrible. I think it was about 124 horizontal lines. So it's actually surprisingly low resolution. Okay. <laughs> Well, it turns out this little eject arm from the media drawer is what hold, is holding that in place. So the eject button on the top of the case here does nothing but actuate this little metal slider. That catch being what holds the drawer closed. So when I said earlier that this is a common failure, must be either that spring or maybe that lip on the UMD drive wears down. Okay. So actually there's kind of two main, oh look, <laughs> two main boards to the PSP. Got this one with memory card reader, headphones, so it's got some analog on there. But you've also got this daughter board with the Wi-Fi on it, which is actually made by Sony as well. Got a little antenna on a little flex PCB, made by Hitachi, weirdly enough. Of all the things that Sony manufactured themselves for this device, they've gone with the antenna to be outsourced. Mm main assembly for the the UMD drive. This motor drives the worm that moves the optical carriage forward and back. It's super slow. And on the other side, this is the spindle motor, which is 
drilled by these four pins up here, which I suspect are probably two or three poles and uh, pulse width modulated, so three pin control and possibly a Hall effect sensor for speed readback. And then on the other side, you've got the little laser diode and the lens focusing on that optical drive. So that is everything that makes up a PSP from 2004. Now, this is a really tough one because the amount that they've crammed into this tiny little enclosure with a disk drive, uh, a memory card slot, it's got some tiny little onboard storage, it's got Wi-Fi, it's got a big colour screen, low resolution, but a big colour screen with a backlight. And the processing power it has is exponentially more than the onboard controller of the Nintendo but I'm, I'm judging it by modern standards. Is the engineering feat of those LCDs and the integration onto that single integrated circuit of the Nintendo better? I don't know. I mean, they're both awesome. They're both now pieces of history, I'm sorry to say, but it's really tough to work out which one's better. I'm not sure I can decide which one I prefer more or which one is more impressive as an engineering feat. Why don't you let me know what you think over at the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. This is a little bit out of sequence, uh, but I really just wanted to share this. It's too cool not to share. Um, while putting the Nintendo back together, uh, I just wanted to show you a little bit, which explains how this works a bit, to do with polarization of light. So light, when it's coming at you as a wave, but if you imagine it's not just a wave, it's kind of a wave going like that towards you, but it's also going like that. That's called polarization, and you can get a polarizing filter, which most cameras and things do. So actually I have no idea if this is gonna show up properly on camera anyway, but the top layer here is polarized and the mirror has got a polarizing layer on it as well. And if you see, when I put these together, they look really, really dark, like they're black. But what the liquid crystal display does is it twists that polarization when there's potential applied or not. So these two are polarized in different ways. So one will be filtering light going this way, one will be filtering light going this way. And because they don't share the same way, they look black when I put them together. But if we put one behind the LCD and this one in front, you can see it looks clear because the liquid crystal is actually causing that rotation. So they're actually now in the same phase. And when you apply voltage to it, it changes the characteristic of how far around the liquid crystal twists it. Just a small little bit, but I thought you'd find it really interesting. Let me know if you want to know more about uh, liquid crystal displays, and we'll do a little bit of a follow-up on it. Thanks again. See you next time.